Hi, this is Steve. Welcome to BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, I want to take just a moment to uh, address just one specific uh, aspect of our faith that I believe is sorely misunderstood. Does the Bible say that we will know everyone from our former lives once we're in heaven. That's what we're going to talk about. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ. So thankful for that access to the throne of grace for help in time of need. I just ask that you would lead us, guide us, take this time, and filter out all of the foolishness, all the ignorance, seal to our hearts only that which is truth, that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So does the Bible say that we'll know everyone from our former lives once we're in heaven? That's the question. I think most Christians think that we do. Uh, I think it's important uh, what we believe about this. I really do. Uh, it's not some insignificant minor detail. I think it really plays on something a lot larger than, than just the question itself. Um, I think it's important because it affects our hope for the future. And so the question is, will I recognize my spouse? Will I recognize my wife Sue uh, as only just another sister in Christ? Or will I remember that she was my wife in, uh, in my former life? Will I recognize that my earthly father, uh, Jerry, uh, will I recognize that he was not only my brother in Christ, but uh, my father by blood uh, in this life? I think a lot of Christians are wrestling with this question uh, because we all, we all wonder if, if we'll get to genuinely be reunited in heaven with those of our people that we knew in this former life. And answers will vary depending on who you ask. I think if you asked uh, certain uh, pastors uh, this question, uh, uh, certain denominations, I think you know, kind of the answers depend on the denomination, the, the, their interpretation of Scripture, uh, and so on and, and so forth. I think that uh, here, here is one important point that I, I think we ought to all take into consideration here. Uh, misunderstandings over the afterlife, and boy are there many <laughs> misunderstandings. Uh, as to what the afterlife is like, what heaven is like, you know, and what we'll be like when we get there. And, and I mean, you know, the, 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 the uh, things that the Christians envision about, you know, heaven, and they're, they're probably as varied just as uh, almost as much as there, as there are Christians. Uh, I, I just think that they're not the the misunderstandings are not uh, byproducts of of just being biblically illiterate. You just don't really kind of know that you know the scriptures all that well. I think it's also because the afterlife is really not being preached much anymore. In fact, I'll suggest that heaven is is uh, is ignored almost as much as hell, you know, in many pulpits. Uh, and if 
it's not, then the emphasis is much more on hell than it is heaven. I firmly believe, and this is just my belief, that uh, Scripture teaches that I think we have enough evidence to see in, in the Word of God that we will be able to recognize those that we knew in this life once we're in heaven. However, I also recognize that there are also sincere, born-again believers in Christ who know the Bible uh, well, and they would disagree with me. You know, not, not because of biblical uh, illiteracy or ignorance, but because they fear robbing God of His glory. If you've watched this channel, you know I'm kind of big on not robbing God of His glory. So my purpose uh, here in this video this week uh, on a Wednesday, I believe this is the Wednesday video, is, uh, my well, my purpose here is just to lovingly reason from Scripture against that notion by uh, sort of laying out several objections from the opposing side and then sort of answering them from Scripture. That's probably the best way of going about this. One of the more common, uh, I guess, objections is that, well, if, if we knew everyone in heaven, we would know our former spouses, uh, which contradicts Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, saying that in the resurrection, uh, we, we neither marry nor are we given in marriage, but we're like the angels in heaven. Therefore, God will uh, he'll have to permanently remove you know, the distraction of recognizing our former spouses from memory. Uh, in response to that, let me uh, first acknowledge the truth that our marriage covenants, I, and I mean even the happiest of marriages, are declared to be absolved upon death. Uh, First Corinthians chapter seven, verse thirty-nine uh, states that a wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she's free to be married to whom she wishes only in the Lord. Uh, Romans chapter 7. However, saying anything more than this, I think, involves inserting an idea into Scripture that is not there. It's what we call eisegesis exegesis being to take out of Scripture what's there, uh, eisegesis, read into Scripture something that's not there. Clearly, the purpose for marriage covenants uh, will end. In Ephesians 5, marriage is, is a picture of our Lord's love uh, for His redeemed people. Now that picture of His love for us, uh, it becomes unnecessary once Christ's bride is with Him in glory. Furthermore, we know that procreation will not be necessary uh, either. But I don't see where that any of that indicates a divine memory wipe. Like, you know, you just, your memory is just wiped out. I see no indication in Scripture that Adam uh, will not recognize Eve. I can't find where God's Word says Abraham won't know Sarah, won't know who Sarah was. You know, without sin natures, uh, these relationships are guaranteed to be improved in the kingdom. I have no doubt that Jacob, uh, Rachel, and Leah... Uh, if, you, if you look at them as, as presently in glory, which I do, um, seems like they would now 
they now do that have power from on high to love each other with a pure and a holy love. Uh, you know, with marriage obsolete, they're no longer burdened with jealousy and bitterness and, and resentment, which, what, which is what we read when we read the story, uh, the account of, of them. If Adam and Eve, uh, if, they, if they could recognize each other prior to the fall without diminishing God or, or sinning, I, I, don't, I see no reason to believe that this is impossible with, with paradise restored. When it concerns the question of this, the, the title of this video, the content of this video, will we recognize, know our loved ones in heaven? Uh, I, I think the, the, this whole debate, this whole, and, and it is, it's debated among Christians, especially among scholars, but uh, I think this debate involves whether the saints retain their personal identities in the afterlife. The question being, will we retain our identities in the afterlife? There's another objection uh, from the uh, opposing side. Uh, It, that, you know, that we should, uh, we should be so consumed with meeting the Lord Jesus that we're wrong in, in hoping to recognize anyone from our former lives because it robs, somehow that just robs God of His glory. Our whole fascination should be on Him and not on one another. Uh, my initial reaction to this objection is that Scripture itself clearly indicates that personal identities are retained after death. Personal identities are retained after death. King Saul was able to recognize Samuel by uh, uh, unlawfully consulting the, the, the sorcerer, uh, the medium, uh, at Endor, we read about that in uh, 1 Samuel, uh, chapter 28. One of the things that most intrigues me about this whole discussion is, is that King David no longer mourned the loss of his infant son, knowing that they would one day be re reunited. He was absolutely 100% confident that he and his son would be reunited. In fact, what he said was, uh, after his child died, he said, I shall go to him, but he will not return to me, 2 Samuel chapter 12. I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Now that's especially comforting to me because uh, Sue and I, you know, uh, we, uh, you know, we've been through some hard times. Uh, thankfully, uh, Scripture is just sort of chock full of examples of saints being recognized after death. The, I think the greatest example of all, well, it, it surely it would have to be, you know, that, that Jesus Himself was recognizable after His resurrection. Uh, if I remember correctly, Elijah and Moses were recognized at Jesus' transfiguration. Matthew chapter 17. Paul, he comforted the Thessalonians well, for many things, but you know, one of the things that he comforted them with is with the hope of being caught up together with them, you know, those who died before us, at the rapture. So, so here's the question. Does retaining personal recognizable identities somehow rob God of His glory? No, I don't, no, I don't, I don't think that for one second. First, uh, 
of all in our glorified bodies, our ability to idolize somebody else over God will be impossible. Let me, I want to say that again. All right. Our ability to idolize someone else over God in glory will be impossible. Impossible. I think something else worth considering is, is that, you know, for eternity, God himself will uh, memorialize men like the apostles and the 12 sons of Israel by inscribing their names on the gates and the foundations of the New Jerusalem. So you definitely have to admit that we're seeing their identity there. Uh, that's... Uh, he inscribes their names on the gates and the foundations of the new Jerusalem. That's Revelation chapter 21. Uh, Jesus also clearly declared that many will come from east and west, recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. They will want to recline and dine with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. Without robbing God of His glory. Without, without being robbed of, of glory, God will reward faithful saints like the patriarchs and, and the apostles with the privilege of fellowshipping with the whole host of heaven, uh, all the redeemed, a myriad of saints, including all of the uh, elect angels. While, uh, without committing idolatry, Okay, against the Lord. Many, many uh, do kind of suggest that there'll be a divine sort of a memory wipe. You know, well, our minds will just be completely, you know, we're kind of reprogrammed, rebooted, you know, kind of like a computer or something. Those who uh, sort of tend to oppose this argument, the, the opposing side, they just can't envision God wiping away every tear from our eyes in heaven without first preventing us from remembering all of the garbage, all of the pain, all remembering the sins, the sorrows of this life, and, and so on and so forth. And, and uh, so since our earthly relationships in this life, uh, since they most definitely did involve uh, uh, sin and, and pain and, and stuff, we shouldn't expect to remember this life or anyone in it at all. I don't think that's the case. I think that we would be actually more at risk of robbing God of glory if we didn't remember what He redeemed us from. Christ Himself, He, re he retained the markings of crucifixion in His body after the resurrection. And you say, well, yeah, but that's Him. I mean, that's not us. That's true. However, I'm, I'm, all, I'm practically 100% convinced, I, I mean, if not 100% convinced that uh, I don't see how, really how I could be any more convinced that We will have the ability, I believe, to know what just what we were we were redeemed from in our former lives, while having the power to not remember it in a way that causes grief. And, and to me, folks, this mirrors how God does not wipe his memory. And, and 
forget his great story of redemption, yet he, he has the power to remember our sins no more. God chose to not remember your sins anymore. Yet, do you honestly believe that God, uh, well, God is God. I mean, He knows all things. Hebrews chapter 8. He will remember your sins no more. It's unfortunate that so many Christians today are just so preoccupied with all the garbage and all the sin in their lives when he says he remembers them no more. You know, if you're lacking peace and joy because you're overly burdened uh, by guilt, you know, and sin. When there's only one who accuses you, and that is Satan. He stands before God day and night accusing the brethren. God doesn't do that to you. He says he remembers your sins no more. And it's no wonder. I mean, the price was paid. It was, it was and God considered it, considered that price sufficient, okay? Nothing to be added. To, nothing else necessary. So I do believe that with it, I, almost every fiber of my being, I believe that we will have the ability to know uh, what we were redeemed from in our, in our former life while having the power to not remember it in a way that causes us grief. Also, as I look at all the verses that are connected with this, all of the reasoning, the rationale of the Holy, the mind of the Holy Spirit concerning all of this subject here, I see that Scripture seems to indicate that being forgotten uh, by losing our personal identities is a punishment that God inflicts upon the wicked, not the saints, not the saints of heaven. And I think that's important to consider. Psalms chapter 9, uh, verses 5 and 6 say that, that God has uh, blotted out their names forever and ever. The, the very memory of them, the wicked, will perish. It'll be as though they never lived. It seems to me like that the only people that we won't remember in heaven are those who are in hell. I mean, it's quite, it's quite possible that we will know that they're there in hell. That we will know that. Uh, but we'll have the power to, to forget them in righteousness. Notice that in the story of Lazarus, uh, Abraham uh, and the rich man, we're not told the name of the rich man. We're not told of his name. He's just called the rich man. He's not, you know, it's, that's Luke chapter 16. Could it be that it's because his name is blotted out? I think that it is much more in harmony with Scripture. Uh, for the saints to view life after death as a blessed reunion where that our relationships with God and with, with each other are perfected, uh, something that we can all look forward to. And now we come to the question of, or the matter of, well, uh, you know, Steve, I really hope I see my loved ones in heaven. I mean, okay, I believe what you say, 
uh, I believe scripture is correct. I think, I think there's enough evidence to show that we will meet our loved ones in heaven, our friends, our loved ones, those we've known in this life. We're going to meet them in heaven. I believe that. I just hope I get to heaven. So I want to talk a little bit about that. What are the cloud of witnesses that Hebrews mentions? What is what are those? What is what who are these cloud of witnesses? Well, Hebrews 12:1 says, "Therefore, uh, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin, that's the sin nature. It's singular, okay? The sin nature that so easily entangles us and boy does it. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Here the writer to the Hebrews exhorts all who profess faith in Christ. It, it, the author and perfecter of our faith, that's verse 2, okay, to do two things. First, we're to remove or put off any burden that keeps us from Christ's, from Christ's likeness, especially sin, because sin ensnares us and it keeps us in bondage to ourselves, okay? Second, we are to persevere, uh, patiently enduring all things until we grow and mature in the faith. Uh, we're not, we're not, we don't persevere as much as God preserves us. James remind us, reminds us that trials serve to strengthen that faith and bring us to maturity. Uh, Hebrews is reminding us to persevere through those trials, knowing that by God's faithfulness, we won't be overwhelmed by them. Uh, we saw that in 1 Corinthians, in our study in 1 Corinthians. He's the author and finisher of our faith, okay? So who are the cloud of witnesses? And how is it that they surround us? It says that, it, that we're surrounded by, by them. And I think to understand that, we need to look at the previous chapter. Uh, as evidenced by the word therefore, beginning you know, in chapter 12. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, the rest of the Old Testament believers, they looked forward with faith to the coming of Christ, the coming of the Messiah. The author of Hebrews illustrates this very well in chapter 11, and then he ends the chapter by telling us that the forefathers had faith to guide and direct them. But God had something better planned. And then he begins uh, chapter 12 with a reference to these faithful men and women who paved the way for us. They paved the way for us. What the Old Testament believers looked forward to in faith, the Messiah, we look back to. They look forward, we look back, okay? Having seen the fulfillment of all the prophecies concerning His first coming. We are surrounded by the saints of the past in a very unique way. It's not, it's not that the, the faithful who have gone before us are spectators to the race that we run. It's a figurative representation and, and means that we ought to act as if they were in sight and cheering us on to the same victory in the life of faith that they obtained. We are to be inspired by the godly examples that these saints set during their lives. These are those whose past lives of faith encourage us to live that way as well. That the cloud is referred to as great indicates that millions of believers, millions have gone before us, each bearing witness to the life of faith that we now live. And He is the author and the finisher of our faith. You didn't, you didn't author it. You're not going to finish it. Will you see your loved ones in heaven? Because you're a good Christian. You know, I'm going to see my loved ones in heaven. Steve, I know I'm going to see my loved ones in heaven because I've dotted all the I's and I've crossed all the T's. I've done everything that God expects me to do to see my loved ones in heaven. I hope this has been a help to some of you. 
I pray for you constantly. I thank you so much for your love, your, your prayers, for, you, for the direction of this ministry. We love you here at Blessed Hope Forever. We truly do. Until next time, uh, join us in our study in 2 Corinthians. We're in chapter 6 next Sunday. Until then, rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.